to the We Are Libertarians Network. Find more great shows like this at wearelibertarians.com. All right, let's get back to some boring subjects. Understand the risk to our country. Freedom brings people together. You're listening to the We Are Libertarians Network. Learn more at wearelibertarians.com. Welcome to the program. My name is Chris Spangle, and uh, this is going to be a brief episode about the Debate Commission. Tonight is the first presidential debate in 2020, and you need to know how corrupt this entire process is, and we're going to explain it to you right after this. Warning, this show is for adults, produced by semi-adults, so the language is sometimes strong and offensive. Uh, I don't know what I said, uh... Welcome to We Are Libertarians, where our goal is to help you sound smarter while talking to your friends. We examine current events from a libertarian perspective while treating modern politics with all of the irreverence it deserves. There has been lie after lie. We toss out the screaming heads, put people before political parties, and give context to the news to make you think. Now, here's our host, a 15-year veteran of politics and media, Chris Spangle. Welcome to the program. Again, my name is Chris Spangle. Thank you so much for being here on this episode of We Are Libertarians. Please, in a presidential season, this is the biggest growth period for us. It doesn't even compare. It plateaus for four more years. If you love this show, if you even like this show, if you can tolerate this show, then please share it with your friends. The word of mouth is the most important way to make a show grow. It's just incredibly important to helping us expand the reach of this program, any podcast that you love. The best thing you can do, yeah, it's great to be a patron at patreon.com slash we are libertarians. It's great to send nice letters. But man, posting, rating and review is great too, but posting, I love this podcast, you should check it out. Telling your friends at work or school, all that is just hugely important for the growth of a program like this because we... We don't advertise. We don't have. We rely on your word of mouth to spread the fact that this program exists. Now, uh, this is a brief episode. We were going to do this Saturday, and then we got sidetracked with things like the uh, Breonna Taylor incident. But uh, we want to talk about the debate commission. With the debate, the first debate between Donald Trump and Joe Biden taking place tonight, and I don't want to date this too much because this will probably apply four years from now as it did the previous 12 that i've been a libertarian uh, but the debate commission is not your friend it is not fair it is wholly completely and absolutely corrupt and i have the documents to prove it this is our great show notes created by sam schultz which you can find in the show notes of the podcast or at we are libertarians.com so who actually puts on the debate that is taking place tonight? It is the excuse me. It is the Presidential Debate Commission, um, technically called the President the Commission on Presidential Debates. It's a nonprofit corporation that was established in 1987 under a joint sponsorship from the Democratic and Republican political parties. Who was left out of that? Oh, everybody else. Uh, it used to be put on by the League of Women Voters, so it was always a much more fair and honest and open uh, discussion. The League of Women Voters does great work. It should go back under their jurisdiction. They uh, did a fantastic job with it. But the Republican and Democratic Party said, nope, we want to form our own commission. And so the CPD sponsors and produces debates for U.S. presidential and vice presidential candidates and undertakes research and educational activities relating to the debates it has run all of the debates held since 88 now josh is israel of the center for public integrity once wrote the cpd is largely a secretive tax-exempt organization created and run by former chairman of the two major parties funded by a small group of unidentified major donors and designs it seems to exclude nearly all third-party candidates now, the mission of the CPD, according to their own website, reads as follows. The Commission on Presidential Debates was established in 1987 to ensure for the benefit of the American electorate that general election debates between or among the leading candidates for the offices of president and vice president of the United States are a permanent part of the electoral process. As if somehow the norms and the media would allow there not to be a debate. 
Um, <laughs> so the CPD, they continue to write, um, their primary purpose is to sponsor and produce the quadrennial general election debates and to undertake research and educational activities relating to the debates. The non organization, which is a nonprofit, nonpartisan 501c3 corporation, sponsored all of the presidential debates since 88. And to meet its ongoing goal of educating voters, the CPD is engaged in various activities beyond producing and sponsoring the presidential debates. Its staff prepares educational materials and conducts research to improve the quality of the debates. I'm sure they continue to educate us on the blessings of a two-party system and how well it's working out for each and every American. Further, the CPD provides technical assistance to emerging democracies and others interested in establishing debate traditions in their countries. They've worked in places like uh, Ghana and Haiti and Jamaica, Uganda and the Ukraine, among others. They coordinate post-debate symposia and research of the many presidential forums. So the current commission leadership, Frank J. Ferencoff, uh, it follows us. It's, it's uh, headed by co-chairs Dorothy Writings and Frank Ferencoff Jr. Uh, Kenneth Wallach is also a co-chair. Honorary co-chairs. Um, are as follows. Uh, Gerald Ford, Jimmy Carter, Ronald Reagan, George W. Bush, and Barack Obama. Wonder if Donald Trump will be <laughs> added as a honorary co-chair. Uh, and then, let's see, the board of directors, there's nobody on the board of directors other than Olympia Snow, who I believe was a cabinet secretary or a senator or something that pops out of me. John Danforth, I've seen that name a couple times. Um Newton Minow, I have never heard of him. It's just a funny name, Newton Minow. Um, notable former board members are Howard Buffett, the son of uh, Warren Buffett, Mitch Daniels, former governor of Indiana, who, on whom I wish was president, Caroline Kennedy, daughter of JFK, John Lewis, Leon Panetta, and Mike McCurry. Now, the first debates, so who did the presidential debates between the first debates and the CPD, the televised debates? Because there, for whatever you've heard about the Lincoln-Douglas debates, which was a Senate debate, <laughs> it wasn't actually a presidential debate, uh, there weren't always televised debates. Television, it, it, the first one was in 1960, put on by Don Hewitt in 60 Minutes and CBS. And uh, before that, the, the, there weren't debates. It was, it was people, they were going out in um, a lot of whistle-stop tours, radio, um, using the, the technology of the time. But the first televised debates were between JFK and Richard Nixon in 1960, and they had four televised debates, and it totally changed everything because once you went off the radio and onto TV, the telegenic John Kennedy ended up beating the sweaty and ogreish uh, John uh, uh, Richard Nixon. So also for that year only, Congress suspended the equal time provision of the Communications Act of 1934. Now, this is important. So Congress suspended it so they could do this presidential debate. And this Communications Act of 1934, which stated that a broadcasting station permitting a candidate's use of its facilities had to grant the same opportunity to all other candidates, minor ones included. The next several elections went by without any presidential debates, in part because of the 34 Communications Act being in effect, and networks were reluctant to turn over airtime to minor candidates. In 1970, Congress passed a repeal of the Equal Time Provision but Nixon vetoed the bill. Two years later, the Senate again attempted to repeal the provision, but was deterred by the House because the bill would have included congressional campaigns. In 1975, the FCC created a loophole so broadcast networks could get around equal, the equal time provision. It ruled that as long as debates were bona fide news events sponsored by some organization other than the networks, they would be exempt from equal time requirements. The next general election debates occurred in 1976 when Jimmy Carter debated incumbent President Gerald Ford. Those debates were organized and sponsored by the League of Women Voters, a nonprofit and nonpartisan organization. The League of Women Voters continued to organize and sponsor the debates in 1980 and 1984. In both years, the campaigns of the major party candidates objected to certain decisions by the League of Women Voters. In 80, President Carter refused to participate in a debate that included both Republican challenger and independent John Anderson. John Anderson was uh, 
really pulling support away from Carter and was um, and, and did really well that that election. If you've never heard of John Anderson's independent run, you should look it up. The League of Women Voters insisted on Anderson's inclusion and proceeded to hold a televised Reagan-Anderson debate without Carter. In 1984, the three debates featured a moderator and three panelists who would ask both candidates the same questions. The Reagan and Mondale campaigns asked for an unprecedented degree of control over the debates, going as far to veto nearly 100 proposed panelists. And for the second debate that year, the candidates didn't reject a single panelist. Uh, excuse me, I, I, I missed a sentence there. So they asked to reject these panelists and uh, the League of Women Voters stirred up trouble and they, both campaigns got blasted, so they didn't do it again. So for the 88 election, the two main political parties wanted more control over the debates while the League of Women Voters insisted on protecting what they considered the debate's integrities. The Democratic and Republican parties signed a secret negotiated memorandum of, a, of understanding that dictated everything from the selection of panelists, meaning the people asking the questions, um, to the makeup of the audience, to banning follow-up questions, accusing the two major parties of perpetrating a fraud on the American voter, which it is. The League of Women Voters calls the current debates a fraud on the American voter. The League of Women Voters exposed the secret memo to the public. And the League of Women Voters withdrew as sponsors of the general election debates, refusing to name its event, to give its name to an event, quote, controlled and scripted by the candidates' campaign organizations. Now, while not part of a presidential campaign negotiation, Indiana has something called the Indiana Debate Commission. And this is controlled by the, um, the it's an independent nonprofit organization made up of current and former media members from across the state of Indiana. And their rule is that if you were on the ballot in Indiana, then you were in the debate for the televised debates. So for the statewide debates for governor and Senate, uh, then you are in the debate if you are the libertarian candidate because you're automatically on the ballot. And what happens is the teams get together and negotiate a, the rules. Is it going to be a town hall style debate? Is it going to be a straight debate? Is it going to be in a studio? Are there going to be podiums? Will they be? Will they have note cards? How many note cards can they have? Can they have pre-written notes? Can they have just a pen and, an, and a blank notepad? Can they have, uh, you know, fifteen people in the audience? Can you bring staffers? Can you bring in, any number of things? And they're very fair, especially to the libertarians. We uh, greatly appreciate being included in those debates. But when you're in the room with the other representatives of the other two campaigns, we didn't have much leverage. <laughs> so they didn't care whether or not we had pens or pencils or notepads or whatever. You know, we were just happy to be there. But the other two sides just go at it the whole time and they, they, they nitpick and they're trying to figure out what's the best way. But generally, the, the, the debate commission has all the power. So they kind of, okay. It's like mediating in a divorce. <laughs> uh, some, some of these negotiations are more friendly than others. And that's sort of what happens on the national level. Uh, it, it is, you know, is how many debates will it be? How many? This time there was a lot more jockeying. Just like in uh, two years ago, when Todd Rakita was running for Senate, he refused to debate. He refused to participate. Well, everybody in the state from all three political parties and the media went, what's wrong with you? This is this is the this is the the institution that all three parties have agreed on, and it's fair and it's open. And they tried to claim that it wasn't a fair organization. And literally everybody, including myself, said, "You're an idiot," <laughs> because they're fair, open, and honest. If you're on the ballot, you're in the debate. Now, the, the CPD is not open and fair because there's going to be more than two candidates on your ballot. But they decided to collude together these private organizations. The Republican Party and the Democratic Party are private organizations. These are not public organizations. These are not taxpayer funded. These, you know, the, the, the CPD is a cartel basically to exclude all competition. And so 
They get together on February 18th, 1987, Paul Kirk, the national chairman of the DNC, and Frank Ferenkopf, the chairman of the Republican Party at the time, held a joint press conference to announce the creation of the CPD. They announced with the beginning of the 88 presidential campaign, candidates from their parties would only participate in general election debates organized by the newly formed CPD. At their news conference, both Kirk and Ferenkopf acknowledged that third-party candidates were unlikely to be included in the CPD-sponsored debates, and neither considered this an important problem. Ferenkopf said, The extremely competitive nature of the two parties will ensure that we will reach the best possible agreement for all concerned, most importantly for the voters of this nation. Well, thank you for your concern, but I don't rem- why are you in charge? Why are you telling me what I, I want to see Joe Jorgensen in the debate I, in 2016. I would have liked to have seen Jill Stein and Gary Johnson on the debate stage. Who are you, Frank Ferenkopf, to tell anybody who and who they can and cannot listen to? So the CPD's board of directors were selected by the two parties while Kirk and Ferenkopf served as co chairman. Um, they hired one full time employee, a Republican former Senate staffer named Janet Brown, as its director. Now, They are corporate sponsored. Brown's annual salary paid even in non-election years. The organization's operating expenses and the debate production costs are paid by a small number of major donors. In 2004, the commission took in just over $4.1 million, more than 93% of which came from just six unknown contributors. Six people basically gave 93% of $4.1 million. The organization's website identifies six, quote, national sponsors of the 2016 debate, seven for 2012, eight for 2008, and 11 for 2004. The corporate sponsors have drawn many, has drawn much criticism from many. Groups such as Open Debates argued instead of serving the people, the CPD serves its corporate interest and sponsors. In 92, the CPD allowed its $250,000 sponsor, Philip Morris, the cigarette company, Uh, to hang a promotional banner in the area visible in the post-debate interviews, the so-called spin room. Anheuser-Busch, Anheuser-Busch, in 2000, for its half a million contribution, was permitted at the event to distribute pamphlets against taxes on beer. So this is, in effect, a lobbying contribution. Now, what are some criticisms of the CPD and some of the lawsuits filed against it? And let me say against the corporate sponsorships. You're never going to get the Republican and Democratic parties to change this. You can bankrupt them. So if we can find out, and there is a movement by open debates to find out who's funding, who's the sponsors, and then organize boycotts against them to starve this particular nonprofit of its power and its ability to do the debates, which will then allow a more fair and open group like the League of Women Voters to come back in and do the debates. That's probably the only way that you get this changed. Criticisms of the CPD law and lawsuits filed against it. The quote 15% rule uh, is one of the biggest criticisms. In 1992, the CPD allowed independent candidates like Ross Perot to participate in all three presidential debates, even though his candidacy never received support from more than 7% of respondents in political opinion surveys prior to the debates. At the time, the CPD did not have a rule automatically excluding a candidate for low poll numbers. The CPD refused to allow Perot to participate in the 96 debates, despite the fact that he won 19% of the popular vote in 92. So, Ross Perot goes from 7% in polls, about where the Libertarian Party candidate usually polls, and got 19% at the ballot box. So a candidate like Joe Jorgensen, who is on all 50 ballots, who is polling, you know, and and right now she's polling at 1%. But normally this time, (laughs) let me put it this way, fear elections where people feel this, if you don't have one team win over the other or else we're all doomed, libertarians don't do well in those elections. High turnout usually hurts libertarian candidates. This is going to be the most, uh, the highest turnout Possibly in American presidential history, it's estimated, um, but definitely since 1960, I think, which has the last high watermark. So it, it ain't Joe Jorgensen's tweets. I'll just be honest with you. 
Joe Jorgensen is is not going to do well. Probably will be at one to two percent because high turnout, fear election. Uh, so just be prepared. Um, people who say, "Oh, well, it's because she once tweeted something nice about Black Lives Matter." I like. Let me be honest with you. I was at the Joe Jorgensen rally on Sunday. None of those people had heard of her Twitter. They don't follow her on Twitter. They're there because they had followed the campaign. They're just regular people. And all this inside baseball is really interesting to us. But, you know, you see a crowd of 400 people and they just don't, they're not, they're not interested in, in what we are, you know, and they're Jorgensen supporters. So, but she's polling about 1%, 2%. But this time, usually a libertarian is about 7%. Ross Perot was too. You get into the debates, you get 20% at the ballot box. You only need 34% to win. So it's incredibly important to keep a libertarian or a Green Party candidate or an independent candidate out of these debates. So, subsequently, the CPD adopted new eligibility criteria for the debate participants. In 2000, the CPD established three standards. Candidates must meet the constitutional requirements to be president. The candidates must be on the ballot in enough states to be able to win 270 electoral votes necessary to be elected president. And candidates must be supported by 15% of the electorate as determined by the average of five national public opinion polls conducted by organizations selected by the CPD. Quote um, from the commission's website, under the 2020 criteria, in addition to being constitutionally eligible, candidates must appear on a sufficient number of state ballots to have a mathematical chance of winning a majority in the electoral college. Makes total sense and have a level of support of at least 15% of the national electorate as determined by five selected national public polling opinions uh, organizations. Using the average of those organizations' most recently publicly reported results at the time of the determination. At the time of the determination, remember that. The polls to be relied upon will be selected based on the quality of the methodology employed, the reputation of the polling organizations, and the frequency of the polling conducted. Well... Those five most commonly picked organizations, guess what? Almost always leave Joe Jorgensen out of, it's almost always just the two-party candidates. It's almost never a three-way or four-way race. Uh, we'll, we'll go in all, all in on our Green Party friends, uh, but let's be honest, the Libertarian Party's the third party. Like, um, So they leave the candidates in third parties out of these polls. So you can't even get to 15%. And then if it does, like in 2016, when it looked like Gary Johnson was going to get close to some of these, the time of determination started fluctuating a little bit uh, and, and came into question. So they're going to move the goalpost if you get to 15%. Now, co-chairman Ferenkoff defends the high threshold saying, quote, our philosophy is only the people who have already proven themselves to be contenders get to the debate. Are you really going to sit here and tell me, and I know that you right-leaning libertarians are going to get mad at me, but a, a president that just, the only, he just said about his opponent that he needs a drug test because it's the only way he'd win a debate is more, and, and, and all right, I'll be fair and balanced, Wes. Joe Biden, like if Joe Biden walks up tonight and he gets the drool into the drool cup, it will be seen as competency that these two are more <laughs> qualified and they've proven themselves to be worthy to be in this debate over Joe Jorgensen. Okay. I mean, listen, I wasn't, that, that was not my first choice, but she's still more... <laughs> more lucid she's not gonna need a nap halfway through she's not gonna accuse anybody of drug abuse she's not it's oh, it's so frustrating um but they've the, trump and biden have proven themselves because people have predetermined they have proven themselves that they, even though they haven't it's just because they have that built in 45 percent advantage janet brown that executive director also defends the threshold, noting that, quote, 
Upwards of 160 people file each election for president, and that, though, quote, many of them believe quite sincerely that if they were included in a debate, they would get the kind of support they needed to have a realistic chance of winning the election, end quote. The commission must balance that against the, quote, public's desire to see and hear from the individuals who have a realistic chance of being elected. There's really only four parties right now. So I know 160 people may file. But uh, many of those are primary candidates. <laughs> so and then the, you're really only talking about four adding two podiums, the Greens and the Libertarians. Uh, the, the Constitution Party's kind of fallen off. All their all their fans uh, went to the to the Trump movement. Um, so when a petition for rulemaking was filed with the FEC and posted for public comment on December 2014, all but one of the 1,252 public comments endorsed the request for a new rule. Only the CPD claimed there was no need for change. Okay. The 17-member board of the CPD has refused to even meet with the four dozen signers of the letter asking the commission to change the rule and open the debates up to an independent voice. This letter was sent in January 15, 2015 and included prominent Republicans, Democrats, independents, including current and former governors, members of Congress, cabinet members, academics, and military leaders, including Mitch Daniels, by the way, who was a former board member of this organization when he was governor or when he was uh, uh, he is president of Purdue now and had Gary Johnson in 2016 up to speak uh, to the crowd. I don't know that he voted for Gary Johnson, but he was very, very uh, pro Johnson. Right. And uh, he's a for, and he said that night that Gary Johnson should absolutely be in the debates. He, he, I think he said, he may have said it publicly, but I know he said it that night. Um, I may have recorded the speech, but he's a former commissioner of, uh, uh, of this particular organization, a uh, board member. I mean, so, in 2000, despite having a valid credential, Ralph Nader was denied entry to the debate, debate facilities. He filed a suit charging that the CPD violated the law and his civil rights. The CPD gave him an apology and $25,000 cash in 2002. Nader also filed a complaint with the FEC on the basis that the corporate contributions to the CPD violate the FEC, uh, the, the Federal Election Campaign Act. The FEC ruled that the CPD's funding sources did not violate the act, and in 2005, the D.C. Circuit declined to overrule the FEC. In 2015, loss, Libertarian President candidate Gary Johnson filed an antitrust lawsuit against the CPD, the RNC, the DNC, Mitt Romney, and Barack Obama, charging violation of federal antitrust laws. Their argument was the CPD, the political parties, and other defendants accused of acting illegally to entrench the power of the two major parties by exercising duopoly control over presidential and vice presidential debates in general election campaigns for the presidency of the United States. They further maintain that their plaintiffs are trying to illegally dominate what the suit called cogn cognizable presidential elections market and cogn cognizable political campaign market for the purposes of antitrust laws. So what did they want as a result, a result of the suit? Treble damages based on the losses, uh, their losses proximately caused by the defendants. Violations of, sorry, I'm, I'm slurring. I think I was running for president. Um, so uh, violations of sections one and two of the Sherman Act, equitable relief, including dissolution of the commission and injunction against further barriers, boycotts and other agreements in restraint of trade in violation of the First Amendment or in violation of the laws of the District of Columbia. Between that cause, the exclusion the, from presidential debates of presidential candidates who have obtained ballot access in a sufficient number of states to win an electoral college majority. In other words, they said close the commission down we're we're able we should be able to meet the criteria close that commission down so as you understand the judges are all appointed by democrats and republicans and the case was tossed by judge Ro rosemary collier of the u.s district court in dc in 2016 part of collier's decision states quote 
But calling political activity a marketplace does not make it so. Plaintiffs make no attempt to define what they mean by presidential debates, elections, and politics markets. Their vague reference to, quote, markets is insufficient to allege injury to competition in any particular market. As withholding political office, running for political office is not commerce under antitrust law. Because they have failed to assert an antitrust injury, the plaintiffs lack antitrust standing. Bruce Fine, you don't know who Bruce Fine is, look him up, he's an absolute legend. The lawyer for Gary Johnson said in an interview with reason. When you run for president, you have commercial objectives, giving examples of manipulating the minimum wage, permitting or not permitting pipelines, raising or cutting taxes, and they are trying to actuate those commercial objectives through government action. If the objective has a commercial goal, then the process by which you get into government or get government to enact economic changes should be subject to antitrust law. In February 20. 17, the suits by Johnson, Stein, et al. were reheard, and the judge ruled that the FEC had not provided sufficient justification for its decision not to engage in rulemaking and ordered the commission to either provide a more sufficient justification for its position or to alter the commission's rules. In August 2017, Judge Janice Brown concluded in a decision from the D.C. Circuit Court of Appeals that an earlier decision by Judge Coyler to dismiss the lawsuit was correct so and that ended the the johnson lawsuit so hopefully you understand a little bit more about the debate commission and hopefully uh, you recognize that this is one of the tools that the two major parties continue to use to hold power uh, it is not hopeless the best thing you can do is start changing ballot access laws in your home state check and see what ballot access law restrictions exist in your area do you have straight ticket voting? Fight to end it. Do you? Everybody has gerrymandering. Fight. Go look up uh, Common Cause, I believe, no, the Brennan Center. And the Brennan Center is advocating for fairly drawn boundaries and has a ton of great information and probably has people in your area. I believe uh, Common Cause is connected to the Brennan Center. But the Brennan Center for Justice is the, the organization that really fights hard on fair and open elections. And... Start fighting uh, against gerrymandering and, uh, and ballot access restrictions. Find out where the third-party thresholds are in your state for us. It's 2% in the Secretary of State's race every four years. And then we uh, we get automatic ballot access for the Libertarian Party or any other party here. Um, in some places, it's 3% in a presidential election. Well, everybody says, oh, Gary Johnson was a failed candidate. Well, you're just wrong because there are many, many states in this union that are voting and ha have automatic ballot access for, for these past four years because of Gary Johnson's campaign. Uh, so, and that fundamental difference is that it was sort of, it was not a life or death election, but it also was the fact that he was in the media every other day. And so people got to see their choice. And so more people voted for the Libertarian. And if he had gotten into the debate, or Joe Jorgensen, or Bob Barr, or Michael Bednarik, or Andre Maru, or Harry Brown had gotten into these debates, then you have to know that their results would replicate what you saw with Ross Perot. 7% to 19%. And then you build on that. Imagine if in 2024, Justin Amash, let's say, is the candidate, former congressman, very articulate, seems to um, appeal to left and right libertarians and centrists like me, and he's the candidate, and, and, and I've never seen a, a presidential candidate announce their intent to run and then get on Meet the Press the next day like uh, Justin Amash did. So obviously he's going to replicate what Gary Johnson did in 2016 by getting in the media all the time and builds and builds. And there's been enough, there's been sufficient damage to the, the sponsors of these debates that the commission an effort to keep their sponsorships has to relent and reduce that percentage or erase that particular rule. As, as you heard, Firkinoff and, and the people who are running this organization and, and the executive director, they're older. So, of course, people under 40 are much more open to the idea of voting for a libertarian. So it's not hopeless as the, the boomers currently running the commission move on and more millennials move into these particular roles of power 
They the, these things will change, but you have to put pressure on it. You have to fight for better ballot access laws and uh, make sure that you tell your friends what's going on with this debate commission. Share this episode. Find the petitions uh, or, or the boycotts. And share that stuff. Just spread the word because once people understand that they're being fed, like the L League of Women Voters, when the League of Women Voters says you're being bamboozled, then more people will be open to change. So it's not all hopeless. Uh, I can't say it's going to change, but it's not impossible. So, but you've just got to keep the pressure up. So you do that by spreading the word. All right. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of We Are Libertarians, and we will see you again on Saturday.